good afternoon, and thank you all for holding. Welcome to the AX1 post-FRR briefing. Our event should begin momentarily. If you're also monitoring the event video, please mute the audio on your TV or computer and listen only to audio from the phone. If you would like to ask a question during the question and answer portion of the briefing, please press star 1 to be added to the queue. If you would like to withdraw your question, press star 2. Please do not use speakerphones when you are asking your, your question. And once again, our event should begin momentarily.
continue to stand by. The AX1 post FRR briefing will begin momentarily. To ask a question, please press star one. There. I'll go ahead and give a brief script, okay, sir? Okay, we're ready. All right. And welcome to the AX1 Post FRR briefing. If you are monitoring the event video, please mute the audio on your TV or computer and listen only to the audio from your phone. If you would like to ask a question during the question and answer portion of the briefing, please press star 1 to be added to the queue. If you would like to withdraw your question, press star 2. And thank you, sir. You may begin. Okay, thank you very much. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening for those joining us remotely around the world. I'm NASA's Gary Jordan. Uh, NASA, Axiom, and SpaceX have completed the flight readiness review for the Axiom Mission 1, first private astronaut mission to the International Space Station. For this uh, evening's briefings, we ha our briefing, we have representatives from NASA, Axiom, and SpaceX to discuss the results of the review. Uh, joining our panel today is Kathy Leaders, NASA Associate Administrator for Space Operations, Dana Weigel, NASA International Space Station Deputy Program Manager, Angela Hart, NASA Commercial Low Earth Orbit Development Program Manager, Mike Suffordini, Axiom CEO, and Bill Gerstenmeier, uh, SpaceX Vice President of Build and Flight Reliability. As the operator said, we'll first start with some uh, opening questions uh, before each of our briefers gets uh, uh, to take some questions. Opening questions. remarks. Opening I'm remarks. I'm not, don't let him have opening <laughs> questions. Let's <laughs> we'll start with some opening remarks. Thank you, Kathy. I'm uh, sorry. Our brief, our briefers. <laughs> then we will take <laughs> questions. Um, <laughs> questions will come in on our phone bridge. And uh, just make sure to pre please uh, press star one to add your name to our queue uh, to ask a question. So let's go ahead and begin with initial remarks from Kathy Leaders. Kathy. Yes, thank you. I knew it would be too dangerous if I allowed them to have opening questions. So, hey, um, this is a really exciting time in space right now. Um, I was, we were just here talking and I told everybody, this is our spring mission season. You know, we've got Mark Vandehei coming back on March 30th. Uh, here we are getting ready for Axiom 1 for um, at the early part of April. we got Crew 4 and mid-April, uh, Crew 4 launch. Crew 3 landing at the end of April, and then OFT 2 and, and May. And uh, when I got into the space operations, it was for these missions. And man, this is just a really super exciting time right now. So um, six months ago, because I know this is going to be one of the questions I'll get, so I'm going to answer it right now. So six months ago, I, I remember uh, Jim Free and I were looking, and we were like, oh man, Artemis 1, probably Artemis 1 wet dress, and that first uh, private astronaut mission are going to be like r right on top of each other and everybody could ask me what are you going to do about that and I said uh, it's, it's not going to we're not going to be in the same place so don't worry about it don't worry about it don't worry about it and so here we are one week before <laughs> and guess what Artemis 1 wet dress and uh, um, the Axiom 1 mission are on top of each other so I will tell you right now Artemis 1 wet dress has as the range, you know, our plan is is to get that done as early as possible. So, so, but our plan also is, I, I think we've all as a team been through this before, that we still got, you know, eight to ten days of processing on both sides for us to get there. So, they're getting ready for their wet dress. 
but we and, and the Axiom and the SpaceX team are also getting ready to be able to launch as closely to April 3rd as possible. And so um, we're working through that and we'll continue to monitor. Um, you know, as from a station point of view today, when we were going through our flight readiness reviews, um, obviously we're looking at getting this mission off and not impacting our crew for delivery of crew to the International Space Station. And so that was a major topic. Um, and we feel like we got a plan for that and we're gonna go execute to that plan. You know, as our first private astronaut mission uh, flight readiness review, it was really important for the team to think about how do we do this and the scope of it and make sure that we had a careful focus on ISS safety and making sure that the, the ISS program was ready to accept this new vehicle and conduct all the work. There's a tremendous amount of work being done on the International Space Station during this period of time with that crew. And so we wanted to make, really make sure that we were ready for it and everyone pulled go. Um, one of the other things I wanted to say is this is really a pathfinder for us. So it's important for us to take these missions and then and learn from this mission about how we can do better. And so as a team, you know, as we get through this mission, we're, we learned a ton heading into this mission. The team's done a tremendous amount of work getting ready for today. We're gonna learn more conducting the mission and then we're gonna collect all of that learning and after we're done, we're going to um, roll that back into us being able to do this operation even better than before. So with that, um, I look forward to hearing your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kathy. We'll now go to Dana Weigel. All right, thank you, Gary. Thank you, Kathy. Let's see, we had a really great flight readiness review today. The uh, space station team is really excited to have this private mission so close to flying. Um, as I think you know, we've been working on this capability to do private missions for many years, and uh, we're ready to welcome some new visitors on board ISS. Um, we're happy to be part of and on the leading edge of helping to foster a new LEO economy. Um, as Kathy mentioned, it's been really busy on board, and we've got a busy spring in front of us. We just finished two spacewalks, one last week and then one this week. Um, Mark Vandehei returning on the 30th. He'll be the record holder for the longest single space flight by an American with 355 days on orbit, which is pretty impressive. Um, the onboard crew is also getting ready for their Axiom crew visit. Um, when Axiom arrives, they'll do some of the standard things that any one of our crews would do. There are a handful of uh, handovers and briefings like safety and emergency equipment familiarizations, and then there's kind of general on orbit familiarization, learning how to live and work in the microgravity and space station environments. Once they get settled in, they'll start doing their core mission activities, which include a combination of human research, technology demonstrations, outreach, and some commercial activities. Um, the Axiom crew is doing a lot of research experiments through the ISS National Lab. It's a really unique opportunity to have Axiom be able to open up the world-class research capabilities of the station to a whole new user community. That's pretty exciting for us. There's a lot of new experiments. There's a lot of new investigators, a whole different uh, kind of user base, if you will, who's participating uh, with Axiom in this mission. This mission also provides some unique opportunities for NASA and for the station program. We're partnering with Axiom to return two of our freezers that'll have critical uh, frozen science samples in them. That's always a, a precious commodity for us. We tend to get a backlog on orbit. Um, they'll also be helping by returning a really large air tank uh, for us. Um, and then as Kathy said, right after the Axiom mission, it's right back to a busy time frame, launching and docking crew four, doing a abbreviated handover, five day handover uh, between those two, bringing crew three home, and then turning back around uh, about a week and a half later for Boeing's OFT2 mission. So very much look forward to the mission. Our teams have been working really, really hard and looking forward to it. And with that, I will hand it off. All right, thank you, Dana. Uh, we'll now go over to Angela Hart. Hey, thank you to everyone who's participating today. I want to let you know I'm extremely happy to be here reporting our readiness to move forward with the launch of the X-1 mission coming out of a very successful FRR. 
This mission represents a significant milestone for NASA's goals to build a robust commercial economy in low Earth orbit that was mentioned before, and it specifically helps stimulate demand as part of NASA's overall vision for long-term sustainable commercial presence in low Earth orbit, with NASA astronauts able to work side-by-side -side with both private and international astronauts. It re represents a first of many commercial missions we have envisioned in the future. The agency recently announced its selection of Axiom Space to begin negotiations for a second private astronaut mission with NASA, and we are ma also making great progress for future commercial destinations needed to be available for NASA for services post-ISS. In December of 2021, NASA announced its selection of three companies, Blue Origin, Nanorax, and Northrop Grumman, to develop designs for commercial space stations in low Earth orbit, adding to the contract previously awarded to Axiom Space in January of 2020 to design and develop commercial modules to attach to the ISS. Axiom recently completed their pre preliminary design review of two of their modules, as well as critical design review of modules primary structure with NASA participation, and Blue Origin recently um, conducted their systems readiness review um, and, then cl and are closing out that work for their orbital reef. Flight hardware for the first Axiom module is currently under fab fabrication, and we are very happy with the success of these, um, both all of these companies as they leap, leap forward in designing potential commercial destinations for our future. It's been a lot of hard work to get to this point, and I'm extremely impressed and proud of the NASA Axiom and SpaceX teams for the achievement that they conducted today leading toward this very important milestone. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Angela. Let's go over to uh, Mike Suffredini. Uh Good afternoon. Uh, as a company, it would be an understatement to say that we are excited by where we are at this point for this uh, historic mission, the first fully commercial mission to the International Space Station. Um, and, and for us, it really is the first of a series of flights, precursor missions, uh, before our station comes to orbit uh, in uh, well, the first module will come into orbit in the latter part of 2024. And so uh, this really is paving a way for a new era where um, there are more and more opportunities for individuals and nations around the world to live and work in, in the microgravity environment. We couldn't be more proud of the crew. It's, a, it's an international crew. Uh, Michael L.A., who's uh, Michael Lopez Alegria, I'm sorry, He's uh, an ex-NASA uh, astronaut, but also a, a, Spani a Spaniard as well. Uh, Pilot Larry Connor is a U.S. citizen. Um, our mission specialists are Eitan Stebi of Israel and uh, Mark Pathy of Canada. Uh, impressive still for this crew is the, the fact that each of them have um, decided that what they really want to do is make a difference uh, for all of us. Uh, here on our planet Earth, and uh, and as such, they've decided they wanted to conduct research. So, uh, working together with mi many research institutions around the world, uh, we're set up to conduct uh, in excess of uh, 25 experiments during their time on orbit, uh, conducting conducting over 100 hours of uh, of research uh, during their 10-day mission. Uh, their preparation was equally uh, impressive. They've had over 700 hours of, of training and preparation for their mission. Uh, they've exceeded all the requirements uh, put forth, doing extra work to make sure they were, were ready to go, uh, and I couldn't be more proud of them. Today, the, uh, the crew is in quarantine, uh, waiting for the chance to go. It's, it's reasonable to say they're chomping at the bit to go launch. Uh, they're doing the last-minute preparations that you normally do, getting ready to go fly, uh, and we're prepared to support uh, uh, the launch dates, as, as Kathy, as Kathy uh, mentioned earlier. I would like to say, in closing, that uh, nothing gets done in human spaceflight without a very big team, um, and uh, the Axiom Space Company would like to extend our appreciations both to uh, SpaceX our transportation provider, and to NASA, who's going to uh, take care of us while we're on orbit. So thank you guys very much. All right, thank you, Mike. Uh, finally, we'll head over to Bill Gerstmeyer. Um, the FRR today was really thorough, and as I think has been discussed earlier, this is a very unique mission. 
and really the first flight of private citizens to the ISS. And Axiom, NASA, and SpaceX, we all play a unique role in this first-of-a-kind mission. You know, and it's, again, amazing that with the teamwork and the way we put things together. In terms of SpaceX, our job is to, to get the vehicles ready to go fly, to deliver the crew to and from Space Station, and both Falcon 9 and Dragon are ready to go do that. The crew is trained, the ground teams and the hardware, they're ready, pending some final task completions. We have a pretty busy weekend in front of us. We have hypergolic loading going on in the Dragon capsule for the Axiom mission. We're also getting the Crew 4 Dragon ready to go fly, and it's over in the Dragon processing facility also being processed. So it's a pretty exciting time for us seeing two Dragon vehicles in final processing, both getting ready to go fly within just several days of each other. And an amazing time, including the, the landing. And again, I think this is a, a really important time for us. It's an incredible responsibility for all of us. You know, human spaceflight's unbelievably humbling and difficult, and we must always listen to our hardware, not get focused on schedule. We need to listen to the data, learn real-world lessons, and make sure we're ready to go fly safe. And I think today's review showed that this team's ready to go do this, and we're ready for this exciting period. So. I'm not sure how it's going to all unfold, but I can tell you we're ready to move forward, and we'll see how it comes out over the next several days. All right. Thank you, Bill, and thanks to all of our briefers for those initial remarks. We'll now open it up for questions. Again, if you're on the phone bridge, press star 1 to submit a question. Uh, once your name is called, please state to whom you'd like to direct your question. We'll expect a lot of questions, so if you find that yours has already been answered, you can always press star 2 to withdraw it. Let's go ahead and start on our phone bridge with Elizabeth Howell from Space.com. Oh, hi. Thanks for taking my question. This one is for Kathy. You were talking earlier about um, how there are so many human missions that are going to space, and then we also talked about this little bit of a, a traffic jam situation that's going to be occurring. And so I just was wondering how we're, everybody's going to be managing this in the future, you know, SpaceX, Axiom, uh, NASA, everybody else is using those ranges. This is a good problem to have, right? So we were going to have to, obviously there's a lot of communication going on now and we're going to have to keep talking, um, but it's a good problem to have. Right, thanks for your question. Let's go to um, Jeff Faust with Space News. Hey, good afternoon. Um, to ask about the schedule, just curious if uh, the wet dress rehearsal goes ahead on April 3rd, um, and you slip uh, the Axiom 1 launch, I would assume, at least a day to April 4. Um, does that have sort of a domino effect on the, the schedules moving out for, like, Crew 4? Is there a day-for-day -day slip if Axiom 1 slips to, to Crew 4, for example? Or do, do at some point do you shorten the Axiom 1 mission to keep uh, uh, Crew 4 on track for a mid-April launch? Thanks. No, you should do it. Dana. Yeah, right now we've actually got um, a little bit of buffer there, so we've got a, a kind of a launch window, if you will, a number of attempts that we can do with uh, the Axiom mission before we have any implications to having to move Crew 4. So we've got a handful of days there. Um, at some point we will have to kind of move Crew 4 day by day. And, and one of the bigger variables actually for us is once the mission gets up there, um, and, it, and it's a 10-day total mission, eight days docked, so once they dock, you know, eight days later, we'll go to undock. And as you know, weather is a big variable for us. And so um, even though on paper you could look at it and say, well, I should be able to launch, you know, this many attempts in a row before I hit my 419 start target for crew four, I think the real key will be getting, for us, getting off as early as we can. We'll want to take those up early opportunities, assuming we have good launch weather, because we don't know what we'll get on the back end for the uh, Undock, and so that that can present variables to us in terms of how long it takes for um, Axiom to undock. You know, we're all going to become like I can already tell how many like daily weather sessions that we're going to be having. I can already see it happening. <laughs> Very good. Let's go to um, Ed Ludlow with Bloomberg News. Hey, thanks for doing the the briefing, guys. Um, uh, I guess for Kathy and for Dana, uh, again, kind of a similar to the last question, but there was a bit of confusion about the releases and blogs that went out today. So is April the 4th likely? And then you talked a bit about Artemis, Kathy, and, and juggling this, but has Mark's return been a factor? And will there be any significant changes to protocol, given that it's Soyuz, Kazakhstan, and, and everything that's going on with the conflict in Ukraine? No, I, I think uh, the team 
is um, proceeding to go meet Mark at the landing site and undocking our landing still happening um, on March 30th. And so that's, that's proceeding anomaly. Um, you know, the, uh, right now you have, to, you have to pick a vehicle. And so, so we're, you know, with wet dress there, I mean, really getting, having the Artemis vehicle there, get their tests done, and then start, really allows us then to have this series of launches um, launch opportunities for us to be able to get off. And so, you know, obviously, like we already talked about, we've got a series of work that we've got to do. Both programs have to, are doing hypergall loading. Actually, or we'll be doing hypergall loading over the weekends, and um, we'll be doing various other checkouts. And so if, if an opportunity opens up for um, Axiom 1, let me tell you, we're going to take it. <laughs> um, but I do think getting the wet dress done, and then that be, and then allowing us in a series of launch opportunities is kind of the smartest thing for us to do. So I think right now, you know, obviously with them, you know, they actually are holding schedule, doing really well. I probably will be ready by the second. I still be holding the third with the other activities we have going on at the range, and then we're going to be set up right there to be able to start as soon as we can, weather permitting, obviously, from the fourth on. But like Bill talked about before, there's work to be done, right? This is the time where we, you set a date, but you've got to keep watching your hardware and making sure you get everything done right to get there. For your question, let's go to Marsha Dunn with Associated Press. Hi. Um, I, this question is from Mike Separdini and someone for NASA. I'm just wondering how much leeway will the crew have once on board the space station? Um, are they going to have, uh, will they use their own discretion on where they can go, what they can do, and is there any sort of list from NASA of don't do this or don't go there or any hard, fast rules like that? Thanks. Yeah, Marcia, thanks for the question. The, the uh, crew has been trained. Um, on what, on the systems they will need to interact with, um, including the research systems, so they're fully trained on that. They're also trained on on what not to to uh, to um, interact with. Um, in addition to that, of course, um, Michael Lopez Alegria is a professional astronaut. He has been uh, gone back and gotten a remedial training. Bring him back up for so he has. Uh, full understanding of all the systems on ISS, and so he can also he's also there to help out, uh, make sure folks understand. But they're they're very well trained on the systems that they're supposed to interact with to utilize those uh, independently, and they're equally trained on uh, what not to interact with. Thanks for your question. Let's go to Chris Davenport, uh, Washington Post. Hi, thanks. Um, actually, just following up on that, because I was curious, you know, does the crew have any plans to work on the Russian segment of the station? Are they allowed to visit the Russian side if they wanted to? I'm just wondering what the rules are when you have private citizens coming aboard the space station. Thanks. Uh, this is Dana Weigel. I'll take that. That's a good question. Um, we actually have um, bilateral agreements with all of our different partners, and so even though this is new to us to fly private citizens, as you know, the Russians have done it on a number of occasions. In fact, they had um, two missions, you know, in the fall and in the winter of, of last year, and so the arrangements that we have is um, each of the private citizens and or their representatives can make agreements with different uh, partner agencies if they choose to do so. Um, if they haven't done that, in this case, Axiom doesn't have specific, you know, agreements for activities on the Russian segment, then um, the way we handle it on board, it's, it's by invitation. And so if the crews want to share a meal, they'll invite each other over. And so it's um, very much managed uh, by the onboard crew and what activities they have going on and if they'd like uh, to visit in each other segment. All right, let's go to Irene Klotz. Aviation Week. Thanks, Mary. Um, Kathy, can you go through the decision points of when um, FLS wet dress would go ahead versus Axiom 
preps, in other words, if SLS folks get to call the stations on the first, at that point, do you stand down till they're complete with detanking? And maybe Bill Gersmeyer, if you might chime in a little bit about what you're able to do at Pad A when these things are going on at Pad B, when you'd have the hot fire for the Falcon 9, I assume you're doing one. Um, just trying to get a better sense of how you're going to integrate this wonderful problem you have. Hmm. Well, you know, there's, there's uh, I'm heading into this period, there's like daily meetings between Charlie Blackwell Thompson, uh, the range folks, SpaceX folks, you know, the folks doing these missions to integrate all their activities, right? This is kind of what we do day to day out of the range. And so um, definitely Jim Free and I have been talking about, you know, the priority across from a mission per mission perspective and what kind of makes sense um, just to make sure that, that we're also synced up on decision points. You know, we were going to do a checkpoint on Monday just to see how the vehicles were coming through the weekend and where things make sense. Um, but uh, so I'm, I'm kind of telling you where we are right now. We're going to look at things again on Monday. I think from a planning perspective, um, it made a lot of sense to us to just get a wet dress mission done, them being able to start their data, and then uh, letting us have the time the successive uh, launch attempts then for our ax the Axiom-1 mission and then heading into Crew-4 and, and working those missions. It lets the Artemis team be able to go do that data and the reconfiguration and then begin, you know, getting ready for what's going to be a really historic launch in June. So, but every day we're working and coordinating and coordinating, you know, along with the team at KSC that's making sure you got consumables and people, we, we do launches and we don't realize there's all these people out there that really make it happen, making sure we have commodities, making sure you got the right support at all the different areas. And, and so there's people working to make what sometimes looks pretty easy happen, you know, happen for us. The easiest part of the decision is just us talking and making sure we're coordinated, right? So thanks. And, and I just add to what Kathy said, our, our two launch directors, the one on the SpaceX side and the one on the NASA side, they're talking daily. There's a lot of shared resources between 39A and 39B, and they coordinate daily to make sure we get an optimum schedule for both of us. And it's amazing how well the teams can work without adult supervision from above. If you just give them the basic guidance, mm -hmm. they go out and figure out how to go do things and actually can accomplish pretty amazing things by self-integrating. So. We're, we're letting the launch directors figure out how to make this work and give us the best schedule back, and they'll report to us on Monday, and we'll get a chance to see how the weekend work came on both sides and, and make some decisions, and things will become clearer as we go through this process. Sometimes it works better when we're not in the middle of it. Exactly. <laughs> um, thanks. It'd be really awesome to have a daily status report as, this, um, as these schedules um, unfold. We'll, we'll look at making sure we keep our blogs and stuff up to date and that you got information out there. I know that that's a big deal for you guys. Three questions. Uh, let's go to Bill Harwood, CBS News. Yeah, thanks, and good afternoon. Um, what is the minimum separation between wet dress T0 and the X, AX1 launch, and what drives that? And for Dana, if a if X1 doesn't go on April 3rd, what are the backup dates? You mentioned a handful, but what are they? And what's the cutoff date before you impact day for day crew four and crew three return? Looking for some specificity. Thanks. So, so the the big the big um, right now the big impact. Um, are not the big impact. One of the, one of the big things you need that kind of drives separation right now for for between the end of wet dress and us getting ready for Axiom One mission is actually commodities. Um, for us to inert the the Artemis One tanks, you got it's a huge rocket, right? And so, or when here. Um, after wet dress, when they're, the engines are, are when they're they're 
detanking, they have to make sure that you've got a bunch of GN2 to be able to inert the system to make sure that we're keeping the structure safe. Because obviously the next we got we got a, a big mission coming up. Well, that takes a load. If you if you talk to Charlie Blackwell Thompson, she would be able to tell you how many GN2 trucks have been coming in to get us ready for this the wet dress. I think we've got GN2 trucks lined up outside of KSC for this getting ready for this wet dress. And so um, the the key thing is we got to get that replenished then to be able to go do our Axiom 1 mission. So I know the team's working that really hard. I think for a little while it looked like there was about a two-day separation. People are working to make that, that shorter. So that potentially if we get wet dress off on the 3rd, maybe we could launch on the 4th. But we're still early days in it. And I liked Irene's idea of as we're working through it, we'll start sending out you know daily updates for you guys so that you guys know where it is. But really right now it's, it's really about consumables. All right, let's see, and to answer the second part of the question you had about the, the launch dates, um, as you know, right now, Crew 4 is on the 19th, and we need two days between the undocking of uh, Axiom 1 and, and the launch of uh, Crew 4. So if you look at that and back it up with an eight-day dock mission, it means we could launch on the 7th, and if we had perfect weather for undock, which as you know, that's you know not necessarily in the highly likely category could happen, but uh, not necessarily highly likely. Then in theory, you, you hold the, the 19th on paper. After that, we end up with essentially a day-for-day -day slip. But again, keep in mind that the undock is really one of our big variables also. And so, um, you know, it could take you a few days to try to undock. And so we've got a little bit of capability also on the crew four side in terms of what we can accommodate onboard station and still do the handover and the crew three return and, and the rest of the back end of uh, 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 April time frame, April, May time frame. So I'd say, you know, we're, we're pretty clean. Still, we're pretty clean for launches up, I would say, up to the 8th or 9th, right? I think we're pretty clean up to that point, um, which gives us multiple attempts and, and looking at successive attempts for us to be able to get that launch off. Um, we'll, we'll be watching weather, I'll tell you, and then looking at the mission and, and what's the right time from a weather perspective and what does that mean. On the back end, you know, we'd like to start on the 19th, but then we probably, you know, we can start going for the next week to try to get that launch off and still be able to accomplish what we need to do. The, the key thing is we have a, a high beta that starts on May 10th, that we really want to get Crew 3 off before that high beta. We're also starting to look at how far you could go into the high beta and get the vehicle off. But, but as you know, we're, we're, we're continuing to look at kind of our margins. But I think we've got, a, a, you know, six or seven days to be able to get Axiom 1 off. You know, we'll be looking, like I said, at the weather to make sure we look at the, how we're going to work the eight-day mission and then our return options. And then we've got, you know, seven or eight days there to be able to get crew four off. And so I think, you know, we got we got a, a decent chance of getting all the missions done. Great question, Bill. Let's go to uh, Stephen Clark, Spaceflight Now. Thank you for taking my question. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. I uh, just wanted to clarify a couple of things. Um, I think Dana mentioned up front uh, the OFT2 mission may be a week and a half or so after the Crew 3 uh, return. I think that was penciled in for May the 20th. Is there any discussion of moving that up uh, a bit? And if so, by how much? And uh, also wanted to ask about um, uh, static fire for AX1. What's the scheduled date for that? And, and does that static fire factor into Planning for uh, you know the, the commodities uh, constraints with the LC39 uh, is that a factor in when you can do the WDR and then when you can uh, do the AX1 launch? Thank you. So um, static fire is um, the first 
So SpaceX is doing the transporter, the transporter four. Yep. Yep. Transporter have, four launch. Transporter four launch on April first, followed by static fire, and then in the morning is dry dress for the Axiom crew. So April first, we have three activities: dry dress for the crew, and a short break. We go into static fire, and at the same time, we, we just prior to starting the count for static fire, we complete a transporter four launch off of pad forty. As Forty. Plan. Forty. Yeah, what, what I was really referring to with the week and a half was the same thing Kathy mentioned in the previous question related to the high beta. And so the, the no later than when we'd like to get Crew 3 undocked um, is, is by the 10th of May. And with OFT2 on the 20th, that's where I was talking about the week and a half. Of course, Crew 3, our nominal plan is to undock it earlier, but that's just you know, how far we could move it to the right if we needed to. And and the only, the, the high beta time frame is that 10th through the 19th. So that's why we're kind of blocking off that time period. So we wouldn't be able to pull up or do that time frame because we typically don't have the docking during the high beta. Event. Thanks for your question. Let's go to uh, Jim McKenna, Aerospace Tech Review. Thanks very much. This is for Kathy, I believe. Uh, I understand with this uh, commercial mission that uh, Axiom is responsible for crew and passengers during launch, ascent, return, and recovery, and then uh, NASA will take over once they're within the integrated operations range of station. Uh, in general, how complete are the procedures for approving a commercial mission to uh, ISS um, and later to free-flying stations, and who's sharing the responsibility for finalizing those procedures? Are you talking about procedures or are you talking about plans? Um, the, the, definitely the procedures for how we're going to do this, all of our planning for the mission, um, um, has been audited, reviewed, um, you know, Angela Hart out of the, our, our CLD group, the program, and the station program have been working with Axiom on all the activities that folks are doing on orbit and, you know, making sure that it meets, it kind of falls within the NASA guidelines for the activities we need to do on the station, and then obviously Axiom um, is responsible for the activities that they're doing in, within their module and the pre-flyer spaces. I think one of the big learning that we've had out of this whole process is how to work together and do that in a way um, that you know we can get it done and make sure that we're both meeting our guidelines and responsibilities and you did a great job of summarizing each of our responsibilities. Um, you know, it'd be great to figure out how to do it faster, and that's definitely one of the things that we'll need to be working on, but we're, we're learning a lot by going through this process. I don't know, Angela, if you wanted to add anything, or Dana. No, I think you, you, you said it exactly right. I mean, we have worked really hard with the Axiom team and ISS in order to ensure that we're meeting the requirements on the NASA side and the guidelines and the policies, but still allowing Axiom to meet their visions and goals for their company and their business plans. And so it's been a real interesting activity, and I think we've come to great processes, plans, and solutions on, on a lot of different um, challenges that we had as we were pulling this together, and we're going to continue to learn more and, and, as Kathy said, be able to do this better and faster. and, and possibly even offer different and, and more opportunities as we move forward and, and learn more about how to work in this commercial arena. Very good. Let's go to uh, Richard Ribot for Orlando Sentinel. Hi. Uh, this question, thank you for taking it. It's uh, for Michael. And I'm looking at your future missions, uh, career missions. This mission is an eight-day on station. Are you looking at uh, working with NASA for longer and specifically as you're prepping to add your uh, individual components to the station, are you looking to 
keep a member of Axiom Space on board for longer periods. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Yes. Uh, first of all, uh, our second mission, I believe uh, that was mentioned by Angela, our second mission um, has been approved and that one is also a shorter duration flight. We do, uh, it, when we look to the future, have progressively longer missions. Our third mission wants to be about 30 days as, as our fourth mission does. And then um, by the time our module arrives, um, in don't hold me to this because we're still deciding, but either once we get our first module fully activated and checked out, or, or more likely once we bring up our second module, which will double the capacity for a crew and, and it adds two more, with those two modules, we have two more docking ports added to the, to the complex. Uh, we do intend to go to full-time uh, on, on ISS with at least one uh, Axiom a crew person, but we will also bring uh, customers along on on uh, those flights as well. All right, uh, thank you. Let's go to uh, Rachel Crane, CNN. Uh, <clears throat> this question is for Michael. Sorry about my voice, guys. Uh, I'm a little under the weather. Michael, you mentioned that the crew has conducted, you know, over 700 hours of training. But can you give us some context of how that compares to professional astronauts? And can you give us a little more insight into the training? What parts of the training are not necessary for, you know, this commercial crew compared to a uh, professional crew? Thank you so much. Uh, let's see. I can partially answer that. Um, the, on the International Space Station, we do really a uh, the the total amount of time we spend training the crew for the systems is extremely limited compared to the professional astronauts um, who do really uh, almost um, something in order of 45 weeks of astronaut candidate training followed by then uh, flight specific training once they're selected so so many many weeks and months of preparation and our crews do something like uh, four or five uh, weeks of, of total, I'm sorry, something like eight weeks of total training on the ISS. The other half of our training is done uh, with our SpaceX friends, and while we do endeavor to train to the same, same level as our, our uh, uh, NASA colleagues, I'm, I'm not sure that we do all the way up to that, but maybe Bill would know. Yeah, we, we're basically training the Axiom crews to the same level we train government astronauts for, for operations of Dragon for the portions that they're doing. We also do a lot of integrated simulations where it's kind of unique in the fact that some of the search and rescue capabilities are provided by Axiom through their contractor. We did some integrated simulations where we actually worked with the crew to go through that entire end-to-end -end activity to make sure the crew would be safe during the ascent in the case of a Dragon abort. So. The training is very thorough, and in terms of what we train them in terms of Dragon, it's basically the same as we're training our, our government astronauts. Let's see, from a, you know, from a NASA standpoint, if you look at our government astronaut training, uh, whether it be NASA or one of our ESA astronauts or any one of our international partners, um, they have pretty extensive training, of course. You know, as they're on board, they've got to deal with and interact with all the systems on the spacecraft, whether there are issues in a European module, a Japanese module, one of our modules. And so their training is very extensive. Um, in a lot of cases, there's a lot of preventative maintenance and work they have to do to keep things well-tuned. There are a lot of corrective things. And then there's a lot of other complexities, whether it's a specialist in robotics or spacewalks. So a lot of other ancillary things, and so there's pretty extensive training for the government astronauts. The, the training for private astronauts is really based on their mission, so it's very much focused on the types of activities they'll doing, they're doing for the mission. Of course, safety is paramount, and so the safety training emergency response, for example, is trained uh, very much like what we would train for a government astronaut, but beyond that, it's focused on daily living, food preparations, you know, how, how to deal with the water system just for getting, you know, drinking water, um, use of cameras and videos, and then, of course, the research equipment. 
that um, they're planning to use. So it's very much tailored to, to what they're using. They, of course, are not expected to respond to issues on the spacecraft or to deal with um, correcting something. If the toilet won't flush, we'll go and use one of our government astronauts to go and deal with that. So, so a little bit of a difference there in terms of the responsibilities and the types of things they're doing and training to do. Your question. Let's go to uh, Micah Maddenberg, Wall Street Journal. Hey, everybody. Good evening. Um, Mike, a question for you. You, you mentioned the second mission. Um, could you talk a little bit about customer demand? How many sort of missions to ISS could you organize right now? Um, do you, does Axiom have a waiting list or sort of deposits down from future customers? And if so, could you kind of quantify the number of people that, that may be on it? Thanks. Yeah, we're in various states of of signed customers and uh, those that are um, have offers and offer really is a, a preliminary agreement to go sign a contract that just lets us go ahead and hold the flight while we work through the contract and then the number of countries and they're they're a little bit different but if you look at the first four flights we have lined up AX, AX1, uh, 2 and 3 are are done in terms of who's flying, um, and four is uh, two, uh, um, yeah, four has it, two, two are, are uh, identified and signed. Uh, there are two that are seats that are open on that flight, but um, we have other customers that are, are asking to fly on them. So, um, you know, it's, it's, uh, we're flying, We'd like to fly a little more often, but but uh, we're the, the demand is we're, we're meeting the demand demand as it is today. We I will say though after the first flight we would expect well we know that there'll be uh, several customers uh, ready to sign. They're kind of waiting to see what happens with the flight, um, and it's just like anything. Once you do something the first time, then then there's a, a little more excitement in the system. So we would expect demand to to pick up. Question. Let's go to uh, Gina Sinceri, ABC News. Hi, I want to follow up on Bill Harwood's question. I'm a little confused. What is the launch window and what are the times that you're looking at for launch for AX1? Okay, so if we go on Monday, April 4th, the uh, 12:50 p.m. Eastern Time. We go on April the 5th. It's 12:27 p.m. Eastern Time. And we'll 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 I I, I promised Irene we'd send out a daily. And I'm we're gonna hold. I'm, I'm looking at my folks here. We BDI them. We'll we'll be sending out dates for all this information, so you guys don't have to be hunting around for it. Okay, so, so we'll get that out for you all. All right, thanks. Let's go to uh, Jeff Faust, Space News. Uh, thanks for the uh, second question. For Bill Gerstenmeier, I'm just curious if you have any updates on the uh, investigation into the uh, lagging parachute you saw on a couple of recent uh, Dragon splashdowns. Are you planning to collect any additional imagery or other data for the uh, Axiom-1 splashdown. Thanks. Yeah, we, we took a really extensive look at the, the lagging parachute. We reviewed all our developmental tests, all our flights, and it's it's interesting that some cases it's not obvious that we even have a delayed uh, our lagging parachute. It's only a couple seconds, and you can't even see it in the video. You don't even detect it. And then if you look at the descent velocity and you just had the data and you didn't have any cameras, you wouldn't even know that the parachute was actually delayed. Even these, these ones that delayed 60 and 70 seconds, you wouldn't even see it. But we went through all that and we couldn't find anything that stood out as a, as a contributing cause. We looked at all the reefing line cutters that cut. We looked at all the lines. We did detailed reviews of all the parachutes and the packing. We didn't see anything that's there. So our kind of conclusion is that this four parachute system, based on its descent velocity and the amount of air that can actually inflate the parachute, has the potential for a parachute to lag. 
So it's not unheard of that even on this axiom return, we might have another lagging parachute. And if we do, it's just a function of the design. We're fully certified to land with just three parachutes. We're continuing to look and see if we can find any reason why one delays and another doesn't. We can't find anything other than the fact that it's at the altitude that we're deploying, at the time we're deploying, there's maybe one, the other chutes actually take all the load, and then that doesn't, the third or fourth parachute doesn't really require to take much load, so, so the, the capsule operates perfectly normally, and it, we show that that fourth lagging parachute will always inflate typically before we land. So we spent a lot of time looking at that, trying to figure out if there was anything we were missing. We can't find anything. I think it's almost a feature of this design, but we'll continue to keep looking, continue to keep monitoring. But I wouldn't be surprised if we don't see it again in some of the upcoming flights. And, and we also, have, we you know NASA provides uh, the, the WB aircraft to get pictures. We've also increased the video quality, so you won't see in-cabin crew video during uh, return. We're actually going to dedicate higher bandwidth to the cameras on board uh, Dragon so we can actually get better looks at the parachutes and see more details. So, so we're continuing to work this. This is something we want to understand when I, I talked about being hungry and, and looking at safety and what's the hardware telling us. This is something that's telling us, and we didn't discover anything that causes us any concern, but we're going to keep looking and keep watching. Your question. Let's go to uh, Elizabeth Howell, space.com. Hello again. Uh, we just wanted to get some clarity about that, um, that date that Kathy was mentioning about Artemis 1 potentially launching in June. Could you please clarify that late May is no longer on the table and which uh, June window you're going to aim for, if that's going to be early June or late June? Well, I kind of feel a little uncomfortable because this is a Axiom 1 mission and I'm going to get in trouble with Jim Pre. So I think, I think right now um, that's a great question for us to take for the uh, exploration systems directorate to answer. Um, right, and they also, you know, we got to get through wet drifts just like we got to get through all the other different pieces, and then I'm sure they'll be talking about it after wet drifts is done. But we'll we'll get your response with the latest date that they have right now. I don't, I just don't have it off the top of my head. Okay, let's go to Stephen Clark, Space Flight Now. Thank you for taking uh, another question. Uh, just wanted to uh, ask, I think the uh, AX-1 mission at one point was assigned to a different spacecraft in the SpaceX fleet, uh, I think to Resilience, which flew on Inspiration4. Um, can you talk about the reason for uh, switching to uh, Crew Dragon Endeavor and also an update on uh, the refurbishment of uh, Crew Dragon Resilience and the uh, cleaning up of that uh, contamination from the uh, toilet system and when resilience may fly again. Thank you. Yeah, again, the, you know, we didn't, I don't, it, it got picked up that we had one vehicle assigned to another uh, mission. If you remember, we flew the Kupla on the uh, Inspiration4 mission. We need a docking mechanism, so it was actually easier to go ahead and leave the get a capsule of docking mechanism, not pull the cupola off, and then put the docking mechanism on. So, so we don't really see it as a capsule switch that other folks talk about as a capsule switch. We were always planning on using one without the cupola and, and using one that had a docking mechanism and, and moving forward. In terms of the, the cleanup of the capsule, we've been, we had the two vehicles with, uh, with potential corrosion. They both have been cleaned up, and they're both ready to go fly. Uh, we did a lot of work to remediate those vehicles and make sure that we've got that problem behind us and, and those vehicles and the weldments will be ready to go support the missions in the future. All right, let's go to uh, Ed Ludlow, Bloomberg News. Thanks for the additional question. Um, Bill, it, it's kind of similar, but you, you guys also have a lot going on in a small time window. How are you managing the kind of roster of, of Falcon 9s? And I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the similarities and differences between an Axiom trip to ISS and, and, and what the build-up was like to Inspiration4. Is it very similar or are there some key kind of differences in the two? Again, I think the, the key thing is they're both crew missions, and we treat crew missions very differently than we do our Starlink missions. And our Starlink missions will push new changes in. 
We'll push new hardware. We'll actually push the limits of the rock. We're actually changing some some of the thrust characteristics of the rocket to actually get more performance out of it. And that actually gives us information that helps inform the crew missions. So we actually know where the margins are. We, we can actually have a safer vehicle, vehicle for crew missions. I would say in terms of the launch, they're, they're pretty similar. In the case of uh, Inspiration4, we don't have to go to a rendezvous point. We don't have to go dock with the space station. So we had the degree of freedom that we could launch almost at any time we wanted to. But, we, but the problem there is because we weren't going to space station, we had to then be able to return within the amount of time that Dragon could stay in orbit. So Inspiration4 was unique in the fact that I had to not only set a launch time, I also had to set the return time at the same time I launched. So I had to look at weather both for launch and for return. So that's very different than station. When you go to station, you get the luxury of you can stay on board station until the reentry weather gets perfect and then you can come home. In the case of Inspiration 4, where I don't go to station, I had to be, it was a much more difficult planning time, but I had the degree of freedom. I didn't have to launch at any particular time of day. So if you saw that mission, it occurred at night, so that was a, a time of kind of the optimum weather that set us up for the landing moving forward. So each one of these missions are unique. The teams do a really good job of balancing all these constraints, understanding what they are, and putting together the right mix to go accomplish the mission we want. And we've got separate folks and separate teams that support these things, so we can support multiple Dragon activities at once. We can support, support multiple Falcon launches. You know, we've been launching Falcon flights roughly about once per week for the first part of this year. That's, again, a tribute to the teams uh, moving forward. I think we've had 11 flights in 11 weeks so that the teams are, are pretty good, and, and that launch cadence also helps us really get ready for the crew flight. So when we go into a crew flight, we don't have maybe as much sim time, but we have actual flight time, and that really helps our controllers be ready and be sharp and be ready to go do what they need to go do for the flights. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks. I think we have time for one more question, so we'll pull it from Mary Liz Bender, Cosmic Perspective. Hi. Thank you so much. Um, just uh, a little more on the uh, differences between the Inspiration4 and this Axe 1 mission. Um, you know, during Inspiration4, I think the public was extremely shocked by how spoiled we've all been with all of the NASA missions. You know, typically we, we get to see uh, the crew in the cabin. Um, we get a lot of live stream footage of all of the activities, including, you know, in orbit and then docking and undocking. And I'm curious if we can expect the same from this mission. And I'm sorry, I should have said that was likely for probably um, Bill or Michael. So, so Mike, well, maybe you uh, want to, uh, you, uh, you can address what's, what's going on with Axiom. Yeah, so so from your perspective from your perspective, this will look a little bit more like a, a a normal I'll call it normal ISS launch. The crew will arrive, we'll do a crew arrival ceremony, um, the cameras will be on about the same throughout as you're used to and we'll have a departure ceremony. So all those things you're you're used to seeing on an ISS crew flight be similar for, for, for our flight, and Bill can tell you about the um, Inspiration4 flight. Yeah, I think what we really do is we kind of respond to what our customers want, and if, if they feel the need to go do activities, we'll support those activities. If they want to do some more private things or it fits better with their mission plans, we, we kind of support whatever the customer wants. Okay. Um, Thanks to all who submitted questions, and thanks again to our briefers for taking the time uh, to discuss the upcoming mission. That'll do it for us. Uh, as, as mentioned, we'll do our best uh, to provide updates on NASA.gov. You can always go there for the latest information uh, regarding the Axiom-1 mission and the other missions uh, we're doing here at NASA. Thanks again for joining us. That'll wrap up today's briefing. <laughs>